morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Supporting Parents with Disabilities in Pregnancy and Beyond. My name is Sarah Carsley, and I am an Applied Public Health Science Specialist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of co-moderating today's session. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge and respect the land, sky, and waters of Ontario, including for their contribution and sharing to support all life within. I acknowledge and respect the treaty, unceded, and traditional territories of all First Nations across these lands and waters. I would like to acknowledge that I'm in Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Please join me in acknowledgement and respect of all Indigenous peoples, their life journeys and worldviews. May their wisdom always guide our own paths forward with open hands, open hearts and open minds for the mutual success and benefit of all in Ontario. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge Daniel Coles who helps co-author this wide acknowledgement and thank him for sharing it with me. I'll now mention a few housekeeping items. To enhance the presentation experience, participant audio visual has been disabled. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would now like to introduce my co-moderator for today, Dr. Karen Campbell. Dr. Campbell is an assistant professor at York University in the School of Nursing. Dr. Campbell has extensive clinical experience as a public health nurse with experience working in the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program, breastfeeding services, and the, Can and the Canada Prenatal Nutrition program. Her doctoral research supported an evaluation of the Nurse Family Partnership program in British Columbia. She is currently a researcher for iHeal, a community health nursing program for women who have experienced intimate partner violence. Welcome, Karen, and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Carsley. I'm really pleased to be here today co-moderating with you and representing the work of PHN Prep and our team um, in supporting PHN supervisors, managers, and home visiting staff in their work that they do with families. Today's presentation will focus on health outcomes and healthcare experiences of birthing people with disabilities during pregnancy, the postpartum, and parenting periods. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Hilary Brown. Dr. Hilary Brown is an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Health and Society in the Dalla School of Public Health. She's also an adjunct scientist at Women's College and at IECES. Dr. Brown holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Disability and Rep Reproductive Health. Her research program examines maternal and child health and mental health across the life course, with a particular focus on populations with disabilities and chronic illnesses, health equity, and the social determinants of health. Welcome, Hillary. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to share some of our research today. Um, as was mentioned, I'll be focusing on some work that we've done over the years on parents with disabilities in pregnancy and beyond. So just in terms of some learning objectives for today, uh, the goals for today are to summarize recent data on pregnancy, postpartum, and infant health outcomes and healthcare experiences of birthing people with disabilities in Ontario based on some ongoing research that my team is doing. I'll talk about the implications of this work and recommendations for public health practice and policy, and specifically explore the roles that public health nurses, home visitors, and other health professionals can play in supporting prospective and new parents with disabilities. And I'll finish the presentation by identifying some resources that can assist you in supporting these families, and we'll be providing some links to these resources in the chat as I go through them. I want to just briefly acknowledge the team behind this research. As with all research projects, there's many people behind the one voice that's presenting the outcomes. 
And I want to specifically mention that this work was done in partnership with a large advisory committee that included people with lived experience of disability, uh, various advocacy organizations and service providers across Ontario. And specifically, we engaged two peer researchers with disabilities as staff on the project. And so uh, the conclusions that I'll be presenting today represents our shared conclusions about uh, the work that we've done together. So just to start off, a brief context on this topic. About 12% of reproductive aged individuals have a disability, including physical disabilities impacting mobility, sensory disabilities impacting hearing and vision, and intellectual or developmental disabilities impacting cognition and adaptive behaviors like practical and social skills. In 2005, the World Health Organization released a landmark report calling for better reproductive health care for people with disabilities. And the following year was the year that the United Nations published the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which includes protections on reproductive and parenting rights for people with disabilities. And yet, almost 20 years later, we still hear that people with disabilities continue to be underserved in reproductive health care settings, including settings related to pregnancy and early parenting. To really understand why these disparities continue, I think it's important to acknowledge the historical context that many people with disabilities have experienced. So throughout much of the 20th century, institutionalization and involuntary sterilization of people with disabilities was common under eugenic notions of disability and efforts to prevent procreation in individuals with disabilities. But I think what many people might not realize is that this history is actually not so distant. And in fact, the last large scale institution for people with disabilities, developmental disabilities specifically, didn't actually close until 2009. And so I think a lot of the sort of negative societal assumptions around disability and sexuality and pregnancy do persist today, largely due to some of these historical practices. And there's much work to be done to combat negative stereotypes that persist. In thinking about reproductive health, it's also important to acknowledge the broader social and health disparities that people with disabilities experience. So for example, people with disabilities are less likely than their peers to have access to sexual health uh, education. They're also more likely to experience broader barriers to education as well as em employment. They're more likely to experience housing instability and food shortages. They're also more likely to experience poverty and issues related to family income. They are at increased risk for experiencing social isolation and are more likely to experience various forms of violence, including interpersonal violence. And they also experience barriers accessing health services, even in universal healthcare systems, including Canada's. And finally, as I mentioned, many of the negative uh, stereotypes uh, and assumptions around disability do persist today. And the reason why I mention these broad social and health disparities is that, as you know, many of these factors are actually risk factors for adverse reproductive health outcomes. And so based on these disparities, it's logical to imagine that people with disabilities may also be at elevated risk for adverse outcomes related to pregnancy. And so with that, um, I'd like to introduce some research that we've done on pregnancy, postpartum, and infant health outcomes among people with disabilities. I won't get too much into methods, but just to give you a sense of where these data come from. In Ontario, we have access to health administrative data for the entire population of Ontario, dating back to about 1988. And this is a real um, advantage in our health system that we have this population level information on all residents of the province that are able to be linked across time. This includes information on all physician visits, emergency department visits, hospital admissions, and some basic sociodemographic data as well that are linked at the individual level using a unique encoded identifier. And what's particularly great about these data in the context of this research is that we can also link mother and baby data 
based on the birth hospitalization record. And so again, we're able to follow both mothers and their infants over time. Now for this particular study, we identified maternal disability based on health records. So in terms of whether they had a disability related diagnosis in two or more physician visits or one or more hospital admissions or ED visits between database inception and conception. Um, and I'm happy to answer specific questions about this approach, perhaps in the discussion, but I will briefly mention that the reason why we relied on diagnoses to identify disability is because we don't have any self-reported disability information in our health records because that's not information that's collected in Canada. And so it is important to acknowledge that the definition of disability that we use was more of a medical uh, definition of disability, relying on an individual having a diagnosis. So we were unable to capture people with self-identified but undiagnosed disabilities. Um, so when we did this research, we identified a number of important domains of pregnancy and parenting related health, starting with preconception health. Um, and so what we did is we looked at health disparities in all reproductive aged females in the province, including people with physical, sensory and intellectual or developmental disabilities versus those without these disabilities. And what we observed was that there were important disparities on many markers of preconception health, including measures of poverty, such as income quintile, elevated rates of chronic physical conditions like diabetes and mental illness like depression. People with disabilities were also more likely to use potentially teratogenic medications and to have experienced a history of violence, including assault. So what we saw was that these disparities were consistent across disability groups, but that women with intellectual and developmental disabilities had the largest disparities of all disability groups. Next, we looked at pregnancy rates. Um, one of the questions that we often get when we're presenting this work is, well, you know, how common is pregnancy in people with disabilities? What is kind of the size of this population that we should be thinking about? So this figure shows pregnancy rates in the province of Ontario from 2003 to 2017. And the pregnancy rate per 1,000 females is in the dark black bar at the top or dark black line at the top. And the disability groups are in the colored lines below that. And so what you'll observe when you look at these data is that pregnancy rates in people with sensory and multiple disabilities have been increasing across time. And currently, pregnancy rates in people with physical and sensory disabilities are not actually that much lower than pregnancy rates in people without disabilities, although the pregnancy rate in people with an intellectual or developmental disability or multiple disabilities are lower. But the take home message from this slide, I think, is that overall, when we consider these trends in totality, one in every eight pregnancies in Ontario is to an individual with an identified physical, sensory, or intellectual or developmental disability. So that's certainly a clinically important proportion of the population. Next, we looked at access to prenatal care. Um, when we're using population-based data, these sorts of markers are based on frequency and timing of care. So whether people entered care in the first trimester and whether they received the recommended number of visits. We didn't actually see that many disparities across groups for this marker, although individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities were more likely to have inadequate or no prenatal care compared to their peers. Okay, so next we looked at medical outcomes and we looked at a range of different outcomes and we also looked at disparities after accounting for some of the preconception health disparities that I mentioned. But what I'm really gonna focus on today is more of a kind of high level descriptive uh, approach to some of the main disparities that we saw. So if you look across the groups, the different disability groups for all of the figures I'm going to be showing you are in the colored bars with people with no disabilities in the black bars. And if you see uh, in relation to the different outcomes, we see that all disability groups were more likely to have severe maternal morbidity, postpartum hospitalization, preterm birth, small for gestational age, and neonatal morbidity compared to individuals without disabilities, with the largest disparities for people with intellectual or developmental disabilities and those with multiple disabilities. <clears throat> 
Likewise, we looked at perinatal mental health outcomes. And because people with disabilities are more likely to enter pregnancy with a mental illness, we stratified these uh, outcomes according to history of mental illness. Um, and when we focus on the left side of the screen, looking at those with a history of mental illness, you see that people with disabilities are more likely to experience mental illness in the perinatal period than those without disabilities, including a mood or anxiety disorder, psychotic disorder, other mental illness, substance disorder, and the rare self-harm. But what's really interesting, I think, is that when we look at people without any recorded history of mental illness, we see that disparities persist in the group with disability, um, particularly for mood or anxiety disorders, um, but as well for the other disorders, though they are much more rare. And so what this suggests is that the perinatal period may be a time of particular vulnerability for new onset mental illness for people with disabilities. Looking at some other markers of well being in the perinatal period, we were able to look at experiences of interpersonal violence in the perinatal period as it relates to emergency department visits for violence. And again, we see much higher rates of interpersonal violence in both pregnancy and postpartum for people with disabilities, with the highest disparities, again, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, followed by those with multiple disabilities. Um, using data from BORN, which I think some of you might be familiar with, we're also able to get some um, sort of basic indicators of breastfeeding, although this is limited to indicators recorded during the birth hospitalization. Um, and so we were able to look at any in-hospital breastfeeding as well as receipt of any support related to breastfeeding. Overall, we don't actually see that many differences across groups, which is an encouraging finding. Although, again, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities did show a trend towards some disparities in this outcome as well. So in the title of my talk, I mentioned that we're thinking about supporting uh, parents with disabilities and pregnancy and beyond. And the sort of beyond period is one that we're just starting to investigate, but we do have some basic markers of um, infant healthcare access in the first two years of life. And so one of these markers is receipt of well baby visits for either checkups or immunizations, um, as well as the enhanced 18 month developmental assessment visit. Um, and encouragingly, encouragingly, again, for this outcome, we don't see too many disparities across groups relative to people without disabilities. However, again, uh, parents with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, their infants were slightly less likely to receive well baby care, um, according to these markers. And then the other indicator of infant healthcare access that we have is emergency department visits and hospital admissions, again, with the idea that these markers sometimes indicate that there's inadequate access to outpatient care. Um, as we probably all know, infant ED visits are pretty common for things like respiratory viruses and stomach viruses. Um, so there aren't too many differences across groups, but again, slightly higher rates in infants with uh, uh, whose parents have intellectual and developmental disabilities, but really no differences across groups with relation to hospital admissions. So I've shown you a lot of data. What can we take from these findings? We see clear evidence of disparities in preconception health for people with disabilities. We see that pregnancy is not uncommon in women with a disability, and there's some evidence of barriers accessing prenatal care with higher rates of several rare but important maternal and neonatal complications, um, and then some evidence of barriers accessing infant health care, though these differences are fairly small. So next we looked at some qualitative data to examine pregnancy, postpartum, and infant health care uh, access experiences. And I just wanna acknowledge my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Leslie Terazov, who led the data collection and analysis for this work. And again, just to briefly give you an idea of what we did, we recruited participants through over a hundred organizations that serve people with disabilities, as well as parents. We also did quite a bit of advertising on social media. 
We included people with physical, sensory, or intellectual and developmental disabilities who were living in Ontario and had had a baby in the previous five years. And we also interviewed health and social service providers, as well as decision makers, so policy people and that sort of thing. Um, in all, we interviewed 31 people with disabilities and 31 service providers, so quite a nice large uh, sample size. As I mentioned at the beginning, data collection was co-led by peer researchers, and we did a thematic uh, content analysis of the results. So a brief overview of some of the main themes that we saw from our interviews with people with disabilities. Um, and I'll go through each of these with some examples in a moment, but really what we saw was a real lack of provider awareness about disability, a lack of accommodation for uh, their unique needs, a lack of coordinated care, some examples of ableism from healthcare providers, a real fear of judgment and intrusive surveillance, um, and then on the positive side, some real examples of advocacy as a critical resource for these parents. So as an example of a lack of provider awareness, we saw lots of examples of people um, really kind of struggling with ex having to constantly explain their disability to different providers. So one individual said, I had to keep explaining to the different nurses and medical staff every rotation what it was I had and why I was there at the hospital. A lot of people thought I was paralyzed or that I might not be able to feel contractions because I was paralyzed. And I said, look, no, that's not what I have. And some of them would even argue with me like, no, you're paralyzed. And she would say, no, I can still feel my legs. They just seem to not always be certain that they could take my word for things. Likewise, another individual commented, when it's something medical, I'm like, well, I don't understand you. I need an interpreter. This was an individual who was deaf. And providers would respond saying they didn't understand why they, I need an interpreter because I can speak so well. And so she would say, just because I can speak well doesn't mean I can understand what you're saying. So again, a real lack of knowledge of, of deafness and the supports that people might need. People also gave many examples of unmet accommodation needs, and this sort of varied depending on the type of disability an individual had, whether they were sort of physical uh, needs or more communication related needs. So for example, many people who used wheelchairs and walkers and other devices for moving around said they were not equipped, they were not accessible by any means. So the only way I was weighed was because my husband picked me up and we'd be weighed together and then he'd be weighed and he put me up on the exam table. So kind of an infantilizing experience because of a lack of an accessible weigh skill. Um, and then an example more pertinent to communication, again, for a deaf participant, gave an example of a pediatrician who refused to get interpreters, and she would get mad with us because we were screwing up the formula measurements for the newborn infant. So finally, I think, I forget exactly when, but they finally brought in an interpreter, and then things got better with the formula and everything when he was about five months old. Um, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in particular, some of the accommodation needs really came through in different ways related to communication and providers using medical jargon that people really couldn't understand. So one participant with a developmental disability commented, stop talking doc doctor terms because not everyone's going to understand what hemorrhaging is, for example. Individuals also commented on a real lack of coordinated care. Um, and this often had to do with having several providers involved in their care, so obstetric, primary care, disability specialists, and sometimes social services. One individual who had rheumatoid arthritis said, I was the one who told them, oh, make sure to get the high-risk clinic from this hospital and another hospital. Did you hear about this person who has the experience with pregnancy and RA? And I wish there was a social worker or something. I didn't feel providers were communicating that well. People also commented on how this lack of coordinated care became a particular problem in the postpartum period when they felt like supports just completely fell away and attention was um, only focused on their baby rather than their own well being and recovery. So, one individual commented, There were no resources. I just had the baby and we're done with you. You know, when you're high risk, it's a double edged sword. 
One, okay, great. You have the obstetrician looking after you, but after you deliver the baby, you're done. Nothing happens. If I'm high risk, wouldn't it still be high risk at six weeks postpartum? And then we also um, saw many examples of ableism or you know, negative attitudes regarding disability. Um, and this quote always sticks out to me. This was a woman who used a wheelchair describing her very first prenatal care appointment. So she said, I met him, the doctor, for the first time when I went in to confirm the pregnancy. He was like, what brings you here? Oh, I just found out that I'm pregnant. And he looked down at my wheelchair for a second and he looked at me and he said, are you here to get an abortion? And I was absolutely stunned. No, we've been trying for a year and we're really excited. And that was a really weird and terrible experience. Um, a lot of people also gave examples of how providers spoke differently to them than they spoke when there was a third party present. Um, so one individual said, they look at me and they're like, yeah, okay. And they push me to the side. And now because I have somebody else coming to that appointment with me, now I'm getting answers. Oh, we should actually look at this because we have somebody higher up. She must actually know what she's talking about. People also talked a lot about fear of judgment and intrusive surveillance. And this was particularly true in the postpartum period when people had concerns about whether child welfare would be called because of negative assumptions about disability and parenting experiences. And this became particularly important when people were also struggling with postpartum depression and anxiety and needed help, but were really worried about reaching out for help. So one parent commented, I remember feeling very isolated and all the people I was seeing, they didn't get it. And I was also wary of appearing to struggle too much. So if there was a way to have a safe person to share what you're struggling with, maybe someone who actually sat you down and said, I know this is an issue with disability, I'm aware of it. These are the only instances that I would call CAS. I would have had more trust if I knew the person was aware of that or if they were disabled themselves. Um, this fear of judgment and intrusive surveillance also resulted in people sometimes not disclosing their disability status, and this was particularly true for people with invisible disabilities like intellectual disabilities. So one individual commented, it's embarrassing too because of what I have. I didn't even tell my own doctor. People don't understand it. I knew I was different from other people. Um, and this lack of disclosure, of course, has, you know, um, consequences in terms of providers then not being aware of the particular needs a person might have and resources they might benefit from. So a real sort of negative consequence of this fear of judgment and intrusive surveillance. And then finally, on a positive note, I think it's important to recognize that we also heard many stories of providers who were really helpful, family members who were really helpful, partners who were really helpful. And this advocacy was seen as a really critical resource for making a positive pregnancy care experience. So one individual who is deaf talked about a physician who really advocated for her to have the hospital pay for her ASL interpreter. So she commented, they, the hospital said, we won't get an ASL interpreter, we won't pay. The doctor heard and was actually quite shocked. So he went and said, you need to get an interpreter. No, we're not, we shouldn't have to pay. And the doctor said, you need it. And it happened and they reluctantly agreed to book me an interpreter. Um, this advocacy piece um, also came up in the context of participants recognizing when providers went the extra step to try to understand their disability and to reach out for resources to help the client, even when that provider might not have felt all that prepared themselves, so they recognized the effort that some providers went to. So, for example, one individual said, I don't know that either of them, the doctors, ever said to me that they have prior experience. I always felt that they were trying to make the best decisions or trying to give the best advice they could, given the information they had, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's some of the main findings from participants with disabilities, and I have a couple quotes from service providers and decision makers as well, who really commented on a lack of training to support care in this area, a lack of time and resources to give good care, um, an acknowledgement of negative attitudes of some of their colleagues, and the benefit of learning from the disability community.
So in relation to lack of training, this came up again and again. Um, individuals said we got no exposure at all in professional training. It really wasn't discussed. A lot of it is self-taught, the electronic learning module that I did online referring to AODA training, but there's no training. So I do formal training for others. And then she whispered, I just didn't do training myself. The training that goes on in 2019, they use standardized patients, it's gross, and all situations where you have abled persons designing the curriculum, or even worse, abled actors. So this is an individual commenting on the importance of training that includes lived experience of disability. So she said, even when you have a standardized patient that has a disability, they don't get to talk about their lived experience. They're actors who uh, do the role that the director designer wants. It's gross. So some real kind of commentary on what could be done better. Providers also commented on a lack of practical resources to facilitate their care for this population. And this included um, issues with relation to how the service system is set up. So one provider commented, because there's a lack of financial or remuneration, some people will choose not to want to work with this population. Maybe it takes a little bit more time and a little bit more work and a little bit more creativity. Um, individuals also acknowledge some of the negative attitudes of their colleagues in relation to this issue. Um, so one individual commented, for example, and then I think some people choose not to work with people with disabilities because there's ignorance around who they are and how they can participate. And then finally, a positive note in relation to learning from disability community and the importance of that. Uh, one individual commented, disability communi communities themselves have been very generous. I'm willing to learn and okay, I don't know what you need, but let's figure this out together. And I'm sorry, I haven't encountered this before. I apologize, but I need you to help me learn. And I always apologize. If I don't know, I apologize. I've learned so much from folks in these communities about how empowered they are. I've had to change my own assumptions repeatedly and really check myself a lot, which has helped me in other work that I do. So again, just to kind of summarize these findings, what we see is multiple physical communication and provider attitudinal barriers in pregnancy, postpartum, and infant health care. A lack of coordination and communication um, across care from multiple providers. And providers significantly lacking training resources and supports to facilitate the delivery of high quality care. And so what does this all mean in terms of supporting prospective and new parents with disabilities? So I think um, one of the uh, aspects of this to think about is to think about where um, across the life course better support can be provided. And in relation to this work, I like to think about this in relation to preconception care, prenatal care, and postpartum and infant care. So with preconception pre care, I think there's clearly a real need to address social determinants of health um, and also manage chronic illnesses and medications, as well as screen for risk factors such as violence. I think it's very similar actually to the types of priorities we see in preconception care for the general population, but I'll comment in a moment about ways to sort of tailor care to better meet the needs of people with disabilities. Over the course of prenatal care, I think there's a real need to provide accessible prenatal education. Um, I didn't have any quotes on this specifically, but many people commented on prenatal classes, for example, not be adapted uh, to particular mobility and communication related needs. Um, people also need better education around labor and delivery and what to expect. And acknowledging many of the gaps that people experience, particularly in the postpartum period, I think an important uh, change to prenatal care for people with disabilities is setting up supports early in the postpartum period so that we're proactive rather than responding to crises. And then finally, in relation to postpartum and infant care, you know, seeing the volume of postpartum complications experienced by people with disabilities, as well as some of the specific stressors that they um, identified in their care, I think there's a real need to provide support in the extended postpartum period. Um, as we know, most individuals only uh, receive one uh, postpartum visit at six weeks postpartum, 
um, unless they're attended to by a midwife. Um, and so in fact, I think midwifery models of care and other models um, that do have a bit more extended support and continuous support in the postpartum period may be really valuable for this population. Um, some of the support might include specific things like setting up breastfeeding supports, as well as setting up accessible infant care um, approaches and helping uh, facilitate getting parents in touch with um, uh, supports related to infant care. So how can we make care in these periods more accessible? Um, again, kind of thinking about this in a couple of different categories. I think we can think about this in relation to the physical environment, in relation to communication, and in relation to coordination of different services. So for the physical environment, as you'll recall, we saw so many examples of just spaces for pregnant and postpartum people that weren't created with the needs of people with disabilities in mind. So weigh scales, examination tables, ultrasound machines, none of which are um, accessible to individuals with mobility related uh, problems. And so um, when we think about the structure of our physical environment, we need to think about accessibility in obstetric related spaces. Communication was also a major issue, as you saw, um, and I think that healthcare providers have a real responsibility, and, and in fact, it is a human right to ensure that appropriate accommodations such as ASL interpretation are available. Um, and in addition to this, I think we need to think about the resources that we give parents. So, you know, PDFs that are available on websites or that are given, um, you know, physical copies that are available in public health units in terms of brochures and that sort of thing, making sure that those resources um, are adapted to address diverse uh, communication needs. So plain text, online resources that are readable by screen readers, um, avoiding jargon and complex sentences in written materials to be understandable to people with intellectual disabilities. Those are kind of simple fixes that are really helpful for a broad range of people. And then as you saw, often these um, individuals are seeing multiple providers and so coordinate, coordination is a real issue. And I think there's a real need to ensure that there are systems set up to help facilitate communication and coordination across providers. So patient navigators or social workers and that sort of thing. And then one of the things we hear so often from our advisory committee is just ask people what works, works for them. Uh, people with disabilities are experts in their own care and what works for them. So sometimes some simple questions and getting to know a person can make all the difference in the world. Um, we need to think about how to equip staff to support disabled parents. Ideally, this would be in the form of providing formal training. Um, people with disabilities make up the largest minority population um, in North America and elsewhere, well, elsewhere, and yet few health professionals, including doctors and nurses, receive any sort of disability training, and if they do, it's usually a one or two hour module. So we need to ensure that health and public health providers receive basic disability training. And I've included a link here that we can share after for some resources created in the United States around what we call disability competency. Um, that can be really useful ways of thinking about the basic kind of knowledge that people need to have to uh, interact with uh, populations with disabilities. Um, in addition to training, and sometimes in the absence of training, if there isn't any, it can be also helpful to identify champions who can be sources of expertise and knowledge on this topic. So identifying a local expert that can serve as a resource. So for example, here in Toronto at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, we have Dr. Ann Berndel who runs an accessible pregnancy care clinic. There are other examples elsewhere um, of uh, clinicians who have considerable expertise in this area. Um, disability advocacy organizations like Don Canada um, also have a ton of resources and some of them also provide disability training workshops so they can come to your organization and actually uh, train you in, a, in an afternoon or a day uh, to provide more accessible care. Okay, so I want to end off by uh, describing some specific resources that might be useful to you. And here's where uh, you'll get some links in the chat to take you directly to these resources. 
So the first one is a resource that we actually created with PHN Prep. Um, this is a nice three-page resource on supporting people with disabilities in pregnancy, labor and delivery, and postpartum. Um, and we have some information, uh, just background information, a summary of kind of our research and other existing research, and then a checklist that you can kind of see, you won't be able to read it in this version, but you can kind of see the bullet points of quality care essentials. Um, really sort of simple things like just ask, be proactive, meet patients where they are. Um, and each of these tips is accompanied by a quote from one of the participants with disabilities that we interviewed. So you can really see that this is grounded in the lived experience of people with disabilities and what often works for them. Um, so you'll be able to link to that um, in the chat. Um, we also have a tool that we created with Health Nexus. Um, this is a childbirth preparation and support tool. I've included a screenshot of some of the pages of this tool, but it's, I think, six or seven pages long. This was created specifically for people with developmental and other related disabilities where there might be specific learning, communication, and sensory related needs. Um, for these individuals, it's often difficult or intimidating to communicate with providers what their specific needs are. And so it can be really helpful to have something where you can write down with a trusted support person what your needs are and then give a physical copy of that form to a doctor or another professional that you maybe don't know as well. Um, and so this is a really nice resource that can be filled out um, with the individual and the support person and then taken to different healthcare appointments. We also created a series of informational resources for the Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health. We have a resource for parents, one for healthcare providers, and one for healthcare administrators. Um, again, including information um, on the topic of disability and pregnancy and some specific clinical recommendations to providers and healthcare administrators on what they can do to make pregnancy care more accessible. Um, so again, you should be able to find those on the website. Um, in addition to the kind of nice graphic design versions that we have, we also have um, plain text versions that are just simply the text and can be easily read with a screen reader. And we're also working on a plain language version, which is a much more simplified version for people with developmental disabilities. And then um, just a couple more to describe. We also recently made a perinatal mental health resource with a US organization. Um, uh, the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. This is a nice one that's focused specifically on disability and postpartum and perinatal mental health. Um, again, similar um, kind of format as the others, including um, educational information as well as tips and strategies. And then finally, I just want to briefly mention um, a clinical care uh, guideline that um, was created based, um, it's a guideline on primary care more broadly, but in the 2018 version of this guideline for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they added some recommendations based on our work on providing women with IDD with specific monitoring in pregnancy, identifying modifiable risk factors and engaging local resources. And it was really exciting to see these recommendations because primary care guidelines for adults with IDD don't typically talk about pregnancy related care. So it's nice to see that issue being considered. I'll just briefly mention some other resources and I'd be happy to share this uh, with the group afterwards, but there are a number of clinical guidelines that have recently been created on disability and pregnancy, including one by Dr. Ann Ferdle at Sunnybrook about uh, physical disability and labor delivery and postpartum care. There's also some US resources. Um, I've also included some training resources for providers, um, as well as some resources for parents um, that are really great options to give to people. And again, I'm happy to share these links. So with that, I'll acknowledge uh, the funding for this project um, from NIH, CIHR, and the Can uh, Canada Research Chairs Program. And here's my contact information in case uh, you have any specific questions. Uh, so with that, I think we have some time for discussion. We do. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was incredibly helpful and um, and just brought to life 
so much of, of the experiences of, of birthing people living with disabilities. We do have a couple of questions and I just, want to, I just want to answer one that's actually come up a couple of times. Many people want access to the recording of today's event and um, PHO is going to let us know about that. So yes, we will be able to, sh to share the presentation. Another question we have here um, is first to thank you for your very important work, but what would you recommend for people with disabilities up against some of these barriers? What should they do whenever they're experiencing discrimination and ableism from a healthcare provider? Yeah, that's a really um, important question. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the barriers that people experience, um, I think we have to address it at a couple of different levels. I think systemic and provider level change is really critical um, because that's where a lot of these barriers originate from. Um, so for example, um, when it comes to kind of the discrimination and ableism piece, a lot of that comes from just a lack of knowledge. Um, and some providers were trained in an era when involuntary sterilization and, and, and institutionalization were still around. And so I think correcting some of that knowledge and correcting attitudes at an educational level is really critical. So that's one piece in relation to addressing barriers at a provider level. Um, I think in terms of recommendations for people with disabilities themselves, um, you know, there are a number of resources and we've heard from a lot of parents about how important peer support is. Uh, so for example, the Center for Independent Living in Toronto has a parenting support program that people can just drop into and meet other parents with disabilities. There's other examples of that across the province. Um, and so sometimes, you know, that peer support can really be critical in terms of um, both emotional support and as well as um, kind of sharing resources and hearing about things that people might have not have locally in their own communities. Excellent. And I, I should mention a, as a quick reminder to everybody that you can continue to ask your questions in the Q&A pod, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen if you haven't already had the opportunity to do so. Um, but I'll carry on. Just wondering in your research, have you, did you, um, did you get any sense of disability and its impact on infant feeding decisions? Yeah, so that's something we would like to look at in more detail. So we did have that basic information from born on um, in hospital breastfeeding practices, which obviously doesn't necessarily indicate what is done later at home. So we only know what happens in hospital. Um, born does also have um, a basic indicator on breastfeeding intentions. And we did see that people with intellectual disabilities were less likely to intend to breastfeed, which is kind of interesting. Um, it sort of signals that there may be some disparities, and certainly we did see some disparities in, in, in hospital breastfeeding as well, but we don't know kind of longer term from our data over the infant outcomes, or sorry, across infancy. Um, but what we do know from other research is that people with disabilities do experience more barriers to breastfeeding. Um, sometimes that's a lack of accessible resources. So for example, lactation consultants um, who may not have enough awareness of disability to be able to give adapted kind of recommendations about holding the infant and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes pain and fatigue can be an issue as well that need to be addressed. Um, actually, we did hear a really interesting story from one parent who was blind who talked about um, working with a lactation consultant whose advice was solely dependent on what you need to see. So looking at the infant's lips and kind of the like visual cues of being ready to um, ready to breastfeed. And she's sort of saying, well, I'm blind. I can't see that. So can you teach me some tips that involve feeling or something that she could do? So I think that um, really kind of speaks to again the need to have tailored approaches to um tailored approaches to care for these pieces and i i see the comment about a lack of funding for lactation consultants in the community and yeah that's something that we heard also was that there was sort of a socioeconomic barrier where some people had really good access to care and others um sometimes there were financial barriers or there just weren't enough resources in their in their communities I have a question for you, Hillary. Um, 
going back to the beginning of your presentation, where you're talking a lot about the disparities in outcomes, I'm wondering, uh, but then, you know, as you saw some of the more uh, smaller differences and maybe non-significant differences in the actual like acute care mm -hmm. outcomes like ED visits. So the, um, is it, is it my understanding is, is, is my understanding correct that perhaps there's a lack of preventative health care happening with this population, but when they become really sick, they actually do get the health care that they need with all the barriers, but perhaps there's like the public health piece that is really, really missing with this population. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that we're actually investigating more right now. So based on the data that I showed, yeah, we do see some disparities in access to well baby care, slightly higher ED visits, but not higher hospitalization. So care is happening somewhere, but it looks like people often have to go to the ED because maybe they didn't have enough preventive care. So kind of what you're saying. So yeah, we actually have a new grant to kind of study that in detail to understand where people are accessing care and why why? Because we've certainly heard anecdotally, you know, a lot of times um, people might have felt fairly well supported during pregnancy. So for example, we heard stories of people who really liked their obstetrician kind of built a rapport with them or their midwife felt very safe. And then all of a sudden you have to find a pediatrician for your kid. And do they really know about your disability? And what if they call child welfare? And what if they don't know anything about maternal disability? And it was this whole other new world of kind of very um, frightening things to have to navigate. Um, and so I think it really speaks to the importance of kind of helping parents navigate the pediatric healthcare system and setting up kind of the shift from obstetric to pediatric care. And I do think that public health nurses have a key role to play there, especially with things like postpartum home visits. You know, if anything can be done just to reassure parents or give them resources, um, you know, help them understand what to look for in terms of is baby sick enough that they need to go to the ED or could you wait for an appointment uh, with your primary care provider? Sometimes it's just a need for, for knowledge as well. Great, thank you. Excellent, very helpful. Um, all of this is really helpful for, for practice, particularly in healthy babies, healthy children. Um, so one of the other, one of the, the next question is looking at the types of disabilities you highlighted sensory disabilities. Can you give examples or can you clarify what kind of, of disabilities would be included as sensory disabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So for that, we look specifically at deaf and blind individuals. Um, we did have some additional analyses where we broke those two groups apart, and we see similar kind of disparities uh, in the types of outcomes that we were looking at. Um, so for kind of the purposes of keeping things simple and not having too many groups, we combine them as sensory. But yeah, we see kind of similar types of findings across uh, the deaf and blind individuals. Yeah. Thank you. Um, early on, you mentioned that in your research, you were using um, people that had had a diagnosed disability. Yeah. How do you think um, how do you think it might have changed if it included those that hadn't yet di been diagnosed? And and I understand from a research perspective why you did why you do that. Um, but just from a practice point of view, should should how should we be looking as as nurses that are visiting? How should we be looking um, at that? Should should we consider diagnosed or not diagnosed? Yeah, absolutely. I think self-reported disability is really critical um, because we know there are barriers to individuals receiving a diagnosis, and we see that particularly for pain-related conditions, things that don't have very kind of specific symptoms. Um, we also see it uh, for autism. A lot of autistic women experience major delays in receiving a diagnosis, um, and yet they still have the same kind of support needs as someone with a diagnosis. So I think there's a real benefit to asking people if they have a disability diagnosed or not, and just kind of hearing from them what their needs are. And kind of a simple way is to say like, do you have a disability or any accessibility needs? And then that kind of leaves it open to them to describe what might be important to them. Um, yeah, we definitely saw that in our qualitative research. And I think on the quantitative side, it really speaks to the importance of healthcare records, collecting that equity, diversity and inclusion types of questions. If we don't have information 
on disability status from kind of an equity perspective, it's hard for us to look at these uh, sort of outcomes at a population level. And we do have to focus on diagnoses because that's all we have available to us. So I think it also speaks to a, a need for better data to be able to better kind of evaluate people's experiences. That's really helpful. This probably um, falls out of that nicely, but the next question is about people with um, intellectual disabilities. And it seemed in your presentation that they consistently had more barriers and had, um, I'm just gonna say it as it's written because it's so true, they, they had worse outcomes mm -hmm. It is how it seemed to us. Is that correct? And what might that be from? Yeah, that's a great question. That's certainly what we saw kind of again and again. And I have colleagues in the US who do very similar types of research and they see the same types of patterns. Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons for this. I think people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in particular have experienced kind of structural marginalization in a in a very clear way that other groups um not that they haven't experienced, but it's, I think it's just more severe among individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As an example, it was an institution for people with IDD that was the last one to close in 2009. So institutionalization is a much more recent phenomenon for this population. People with IDD specifically were targeted for involuntary sterilization up until the 1980s. Um, uh, often we hear stories from those individuals that providers encourage abortions, um, they're overrepresented in the child welfare system, even when there's no evidence of abuse or neglect. So there's just so many examples of how these individuals are marginalized, and I think that plays out in their um, other social determinants of health, like poverty, and it plays out in their access to health care. Um, and their ability to kind of build a trusting relationship with their healthcare provider. So really speaks to the importance of building trust with that group. Um, but I will say, even for the other groups, it's also important to recognize that there's heterogeneity within groups. So one individual's experience is not going to be the same as the next. Um, it's obviously very multifaceted. Fantastic answer. Thank you. And um, horrifying, but uh, really important information to know. Uh, the next, I, I think this is a comment, but I would love to hear your, um, I'd love to hear your, your feelings on it. And I will give a shout out to the CK Public Health Unit for, for, for bringing this forward. But they're saying, um, perhaps, do you have a disability or accessibility need might be a better question on the HBHC screen rather than do you or your partner have a disability that could impact parenting? And I'm thinking specifically about the comments that you said about intrusive um, surveillance, and maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe the current version of the perinatal record has a similar type of uh, disability item that kind of ties it to parenting as it relates to developmental disability. I completely agree. I think the wording of those questions, which have been around for quite some time, makes an unfair link between disability and parenting ability. Uh, we know that many, if not most, parents with disabilities can parent perfectly well with appropriate supports. Um, and so I think it's important, you know, to address those questions from a strength-based approach, a family-centered approach, not make negative assumptions and not phrase questions in a way that makes that negative link. So I agree, more neutral wording um, that's more focused on identifying and addressing accessibility needs is, is much more um, helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fantastic. And I think it's a really important um, aspect of the work that we do with families, uh, particularly in Healthy Babies, Healthy Children and the Nurse Family Partnership Program in all of the home visiting that we do in, um, in the parenting programs in Ontario. So thank you so much for this. Um, it certainly opens my eyes and I'm sure many others as well. So as we wrap up today's webinar, I would like to thank Dr. Hilary Brown for presenting such a great, um, a great overview of, of your work. And we, we really thank you for that. And also to Dr. Sarah Carsley for co-moderating with me. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today for our PHO webinar. You can expect to receive a brief anonymous survey for today's session. Please try to complete it. It really helps us to improve our programming and what we present here for you.
A reminder to everyone to save the date, topic, the Ontario Public Health Convention will be held on March 26th and April 3rd in 2024. It's now, we're now accepting abstract submissions for the program. Um, check out topic or topHC.ca for details. And lastly, to access past presentations and view our confirmed upcoming presentations, including one coming up next month, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events and click on presentations. You can also go to phnprep.ca where you can find uh, Dr. Hillary Brown and, and uh, Dr. Leslie Teroff's uh, uh, resource that they talked about as well as um, our upcoming presentations that we'll do here. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.